exists on the screen. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Backlot Banter movie review. My name is Tucker Hazel and this is my co-host, just absolutely mired in controversy, Tanner Dykstra. And today we are here to talk about Netflix's first NC-17 movie, Blonde, directed by Andrew Dominic and starring Ana de Armas. This movie has been taking the internet and movie discussion by storm, and not in a good way, but we're here to give you our thoughts on it. But if you want to talk, talk to us about this movie, and while being respectful, you can join our Discord, that link is in the top description, and while you're down there, you can leave a comment, a respectful comment, uh, with your thoughts on this movie, or the controversy if you, if you des decide to, uh, and uh, subscribe to our channel and like this video. Uh, and uh, Tanner? You and I sat down, subjected ourselves to 200 and... No. 240 minutes. <laughs> to, to two hours and 44 minutes of Blonde. You came out the other end. How did you feel? Tucker, I want to preface our review of Blonde with this. Obviously, as you noted, this film is mired in controversy. And uh, it is going it is going to, you know, spur a lot of uh, negative comments and positive comments on either side. You know, this is very uh, d actually, despite what the letterbox thing, the letterbox is a very even distribution yeah. across all sorts of ratings. But people have strong feelings about Blonde nonetheless. And as somebody who enjoyed the film Blonde uh, quite a bit, I might add. I would like to have a conversation, a constructive conversation with someone who despised it or disliked it even to a to a to a middling degree. So in the comments, in the discord down below, uh, join join up if you haven't already. I, and uh, I'd love to have a conversation about, you know, the negative aspects that someone finds in this film, because if you haven't seen the film, a don't say any opinions on the film because yeah. you haven't seen it and B. The controversy is quite overblown, at least from yeah. my perspective. As someone who was keeping up with the gossip, keeping up with the drama, I was expecting some maximalist, gross, over-the-top, ju just absolutely raunchy imagery and, and, and plot points and things like that in this movie. Yeah. And it's not that. I mean, the scenes, uh, the sequences, the the imagery that everyone was making a big deal out of, you know, that that was really sold as like this is what Blonde is at its mm -hmm. core. You know, it is you know our abortion POV shots. It is uh, sexual violence uh, inflicted upon Marilyn Monroe. Those are short, fleeting moments in this over two and a half hour film. Yeah. Um, and I found that this the entire runtime Blonde as a whole as a product an artistic product to be quite beautiful. I mean, obviously, I mean, Andrew Dominic's direction here is really astounding. The visual variance that he brings into this film is something to be admired, I think. And then uh, we can obviously get into the story and Ana de Armas' uh, brilliant performance, but Tucker, I want to know what you thought since I rambled on there for a while. No, it's okay, because I, I pretty much agree with you across the board. I think you and I aren't going to... Aren't... You and I, between the two of us, aren't going to disagree very much, but that's okay. That's how it comes out sometimes. We actually didn't talk too much while we were watching this movie. We no. were just trying to sit there, take it all in, and I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, at least in, in my experience, for there to be the moment that it switched over to being the vile cinematic piece of trash that a lot of people online are not lauding, but opposite lauding it mm -hmm. as. Uh, and, and that never really happened to me. I, I agree with you. The moments that really spurred on that controversy are just shots. Maybe a total of two, two and a half minutes across the entire runtime of the film, but a very minor in the grand scheme of things. And though I think this movie is uh, is very good, I think it is, is certainly flawed in a few areas that I want to get into. Mm. Uh, number one of, of which I would say is the length. I, I think uh, as this film nears its end, I, it, I, it loses a lot of steam for me, um, but has a really strong opening. I think that Anna Darmus' performance is one for the books and is frankly very sad that this movie got the controversy that it did because it's absolutely not her fault and her performance is, is probably the best performance she's ever given and she's not going to be recognized very much for it because people are just going to be talking about how this movie is as controversial it is, as it is. But I also think that it's just... You're right. It, it's beautiful artistically, uh, very impressive visuals, really interesting editing choices, interesting sound choices. It's, it's just a very distinct artistic vision. And 
there's not much like it in the world of not biopics because this film is a fictional retelling of parts of her life Mm -hmm. Uh, but movies based on people's lives especially based on real people's lives in actual history there's nothing really like this and uh, breaking free of what we know to be the exact tropes of retelling someone's life, especially famous people's lives and all these music biopics and, and otherwise that we get every year, this definitely stands out. And that's why I think it really deserves some praise and, and why I'm disheartened that this movie is getting half stars, one stars, two stars from people because there's so much quality here that I really don't think it deserves that low score. No, I I absolutely agree, Tucker. Because let's talk about the, let's talk about the the story of the film here, which is I think what people are largely taking issue with. I mean, sure. the, this narrative, this fictionalized narrative adapted from the Joyce Carol Oates uh, fictional account of Marilyn Monroe's life, um, and it is a story of Marilyn Monroe being victimized throughout her entire life, from her mentally unstable and unwell abusive mother to the uh, sexually abusive Hollywood studio system of the 1940s and 1950s to, you know, her first husband, Joe DiMaggio, to other men that crop up in her life, ultimately to, you know, including, like, uh, the uh, president, JFK, um, ultimately to, you know, the stay-in doctors that kept her drugged up in the, in, in the final years of her life. This movie is about the victimization of Marilyn Monroe, and that is going to be uncomfortable for a lot of viewers. I mean, this is certainly not a film that um, pulls its punches in, in terms of depicting those broad strokes of victimization, of her drug use, of her domestic abuse and stuff yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can certainly see why the contents of this film might be uh, triggering or unappealing, uh, or, you know, uh, for, for a lot of people, but what, what, what did you think, I, mean, I guess about the, I didn't talk about the story there, but Tucker, what did you think about the story of the film? Well, it's interesting that you, you start off with that because that's the narrative about Blonde, that it's mm-hmm. just about these things and it's very focused on the darker more abusive aspects of her life but i don't necessarily th- well that's certainly true in mm-hmm. part i don't think that that is the real story of the film blonde for me the narrative of the film centers around Mel or monroe or her actual name norma jean uh coming to terms with the fact that she feels distanced from herself and that the persona of marilyn monroe that people see upon the screen and that what we as a culture, as American audiences, watching old movies, knowing the cultural icon of Marilyn Monroe, that's not who Norma Jean saw herself as. And constantly being reminded that and seeing that gap grow farther and farther, I found to be a really compelling way to depict the disillusionment of fame. And as she starts off all bushy-tailed and bright-eyed, of course having that abusive past, but realizing that it, it there's not this... Uh, the fame that everyone puts onto her, she doesn't see on herself. And I found that to be a really introspective and personal look at fame that we don't usually get uh, from films about famous people's lives. This felt a lot more intimate than the other ones. And I think that's because of certain editing and pacing choices in which this film is explicitly only about Marilyn Monroe. And and every scene that we see, almost every scene includes her. Uh, There isn't it doesn't concern itself with side plots or extra characters. It's just about her life and how she's feeling. And that, for as long as the movie was, really connected me to this character that is Norma Jean slash Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. I think um, I, I've seen complaints that call the narrative here messy or sloppy or, you know, some that leave some, some threads hanging and stuff like that. And I guess I can see that, you know, we have... You know, plot points, uh, a, one of the few scenes that excludes uh, Marilyn Monroe and Ana de Armas, which is the scene between um, her, uh, Charlie Chaplin Jr. and George R. What's-His-Face Jr. and Joe DiMaggio when they give her, when they give him the uh, the nude photos of, of mm-hmm. Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe from years ago. Um, that plot point is maybe left hanging a little bit. Um, but I think what uh, Andrew Dominic, you know, directing and writing for the screen this film is much more concerned with is painting a broad picture. Is I, I did read an interview with him just because, I, 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 you know, this is a controversial film. I want to try and understand it a little bit more. He said he was much more concerned with 
you know, the images uh, that we that we find of of Marilyn Monroe, the understanding that we have and helping him as a filmmaker and as a writer to discover uh, his own understanding through the creation of this film. And mm. that might be why it seems a little scatterbrained, maybe. Sure. Um, you know, from a storytelling perspective, I think there is, well, even from a visual perspective, I mean, the, the visuals of this film are quite varied, and there's different there's different aspect ratios and color grading and X, Y, and Z and editing, and editing tricks and, and stuff like that. I think it is a bit um, scattered, um, but I think that is, you know, just maybe Andrew Dominic finding his way through this film as he said he was, which is really interesting. Yeah, and I think the variance of the visuals is one of the, mo the things that most impressed me. I, as I said, I was I was very connected to the character of Norma Jean, but it was seeing the different kinds of color grading and the different types of editing and stylistic techniques that are used throughout that kept me on my toes because this movie will just switch between color and black and white sometimes even within a scene and yeah. you're like huh why uh and i i i'm asking myself that why were these choices made um because it's not explicitly clear through the tone of the sequences or where they take place in the timeline if the color has something to do with that i don't as far as i can tell it doesn't but i think it's interesting just totally unique to be swapping between color styles and, and aspect ratios and uh, and, a, and quite a few really interesting uh, shot techniques of, but while well, always keeping uh, focus on Norma Jean and 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 her facial expressions and what's going on in her in her mind, and I found that to be a really interesting like kaleidoscope of visuals around, but all centered around her. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Tucker, you bring up um how you know there there seems to be no rhyme or reason as to when we switch from color to black and white or from yeah. one aspect ratio to another and that is included in the in the andrew dominic the sight and sound uh andrew dominic interview is what i read today um but what something he said there was that yeah the aspect ratio does change a lot and these things do change a lot and that's only because you know i was working the visual imagery i was working off of were physical images of, of marilyn mm. monroe and if there was a shot that I wanted that re that if there was an image that I saw that I wanted to translate into the film, I copied the color and aspect ratio of that photo. Huh. Um, and that's something that I really noticed throughout this film is that we've all seen these iconic photos of Marilyn Monroe. And he Andrew Dominic replicates these throughout the film. There are probably over a dozen where I'm like, I've seen that picture before. Yeah. I've seen I've seen her sitting on the couch talking on the phone. I've seen her in that position, in yeah. that dress, in this situation. And uh, I think that's really interesting as a commitment to this sort of images of Marilyn Monroe um, yeah. idea that Andrew Dominic has carried throughout because she is a woman who lives on in images she is you know she is she was tortured throughout her life by uh the by the by the hollywood producers and by her rabid fan base and things like that and she lives on in these images because that's how we remember her and she had the she had her personal photographer follow following her around uh, you know probably i think that's really interesting as to why we have all these images of her all these iconic mm. images of her yeah, yeah and i think andrew dominic in this film takes that idea of the public wanting to be with Marilyn all the time and wanting all these images of uh, her in, the, in these various locations and these various outfits. He takes that idea of wanting to be with her to its logical end, where, wherein he, he says, this is what it's like to actually be with this woman who the public tortured, who yeah. the, the system tortured all the time. This is what that actually means to be with her all the time. Yeah, and it's really, uh, that's what really connects you to Norma Jean as a person is getting a lot of moments of her on a very personal scale of just her in a room either sort of talking herself through things or thinking back to her past time and conversations are interwoven in really interesting ways that bring out different aspects of her character uh, and I think the core theme of this film for her as a person is the isolation that she feels from herself from her identity from those around her and there's this really interesting line that uh, that she says and i'm, I'm gonna paraphrase well when she's sitting on the beach um with with charlie chaplin jr and edward g robinson jr uh where she says something along the lines of that, that there's all these stars in the sky but each of them are are so lonely in themselves which is 
uh, because they're so far apart. And that's not something we really think of from our perspective down here, looking up at the stars. They seem so close together, you know, from, from what we can see, they're just, there's a couple inches apart, mm -hmm. but obviously light years and, and galaxies between them. Um, but that was like a really interesting reframing of the idea of fame because you've got, you know, Paramount back in it, the golden age of Hollywood saying we've got more stars than there are in the sky. But when you really think about that, maybe it means that these stars are isolated. And Marilyn Monroe is a great uh, uh, example of that in that she was the biggest icon of her time and arguably still is one of the biggest icons in film history. But she was a very isolated and lonely person and didn't feel connections to a lot of people because she'd had such a difficult childhood and because everyone was trying to take advantage of her. Even the people that she trusted the most, like this guy Whitey, and I have no clue what her what their dynamic was it wasn't exactly explored but he's still exploiting her even in her darkest moments when she's having a, a moment of uh, of emotional distress or um or drug addiction or things like that i i found that to be really powerful to learn about fame through the lens of isolation and distance and some sort of dark depression that comes with that yeah um, well, we've talked about these things on sort of a, a macro level, but I do want to kind of zero in on, on a couple of things, a couple more specific yeah. things, uh, issues and praises that I have of the film both. Uh, issue, issue number one, and really the only one that I have, I would say, uh, specifically is some of these lines, some of these beats in the script can feel a bit cornball-y, like sure. especially some lines that Dominic has uh, Ana de Armas saying, like... Uh, we, we were just talking about how the film is about, you know, partially about her distance from other, her her feeling alienated from others, and especially herself with these, this like Jekyll and Hyde uh, thing that she has going with the Norma Jean and the Marilyn Monroe, but um, specifically from other people, when she first marries Joe DiMaggio, and she's speaking with uh, his family, and she's talking to him later, and she's like, it's weird, you know, these people, when these people, when it's a, a real scene and stuff like that, I'm like, okay, Andrew, I see what you're doing here. You're saying that Marilyn Monroe, like, has a tough time differentiating real human interaction from movie scenes. Hmm. I mean, it's it's on the nose and, 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 th and stuff like that. But there are other uh, lines like that I wrote down um, when she's like, oh boy, what a crazy dream at the end of it when she's getting out of bed and she's like covered in blood or um, when she's like driving around frantically on the 4th of July uh, in that one sequence and she's like, oh, why did God make so many people? I think it's I think it's a writing issue and maybe a, yeah. a delivery issue because Ana de Armas, very good in this movie. You know, she has a, she, she drills home the tragedy of the Marilyn Monroe depicted in Blonde. But also, I don't think, and this is a this was something that was coming out um, in early reviews of this. I don't think she nails the Marilyn Monroe accent and way yeah. of speaking. You can you can hear the Ana de Armas coming through, and I I'm not saying that's a huge issue. I mean, she has the visual look down. It, it, it she's basically a one for one uh, visual look alike here. It's just that uh, sometimes her line delivery can sound a little bit like she's still trying to master that uh, that Marilyn Monroe way of speaking. Yeah, but I don't think that that, that didn't really hinder my, the uh, enjoyment of her performance for me because I kind of felt like this was supposed to be and, and is through the story that is being told, not exactly Marilyn yeah, fair, Monroe. Fair and, and, uh, and seeing how Ana de Armas melts into the persona of Marilyn Monroe and Norma Jean and how those two uh, interplay, but then there's still you can still feel elements of Ana de Armas' distinct version of of this person as a character and i found that to be pretty compelling the one thing i would say about the writing is i agree about those cornball moments they're, they're relatively few and far between there mm -hmm. i mean they're not constant um but one thing i really did not like and this is one of the things that people are really calling out a lot is that marilyn monroe calls each of her husband's daddy like every time she's interacting yeah. with them and that really got on my nerves and I don't know if that's something that she did in real life or if that was made up for the book or if Andrew Dominic came up with that for this um, but it's weird man and and it makes all those sequences feel even more awkward and my how I was feeling in those moments when she's calling them daddy I feel like that's how people who don't like this movie were feeling for the entire runtime and I'm like okay yeah I'm getting elements of that here for me mm -hmm. personally 
Um, I just wanted to, in but before we maybe start wrapping up here, talk about some of my favorite moments visually from this film. Yeah, sure. Because, as we said, this is a visual buffet, essentially. There is something for... There's a style, there is a color, there is an aspect radio, a ratio for everyone yeah, in, yeah. in this movie. Um, and one of my personal favorite sequences, if I'm just to list one, is... The right towards the end to sort of signify Marilyn Monroe's sort of drug induced paranoia, this sort of like night vision tracking her around yeah, her yeah. home as like you see people like slipping in and out of closets and, and ducking behind into corners and stuff like that. That is a brilliant way to sort of um, drive home this idea of paranoia and i thought it was so it was it's it was so visually striking and such a departure from even other things we, he had seen previously in the movie because there, there becomes a repetition of aspect ratio black and white color and then something completely different yeah yeah it, it, it is those one-off moments that make this film feel so visually distinct is there's that shot of the night vision you're never going to see that again you're probably not going to see it in many other movies especially not ones that are not a horror movie or taking mm -hmm. some reason where that would be more explicitly used. It's just used to have this one sequence feel uneasy and stand out. And there's a number of those. For me, it's it's certain shots that play with, um, as I said earlier, uh, focusing in on Norma Jean, but then having the isolation of so many people around her, like pressing in on her. There's this one shot where they're watching a movie and and the film finishes, and we start, we end on a close up of her, and we zoom out to show just hundreds and hundreds of people in this theater. But you can still see her very clearly in the middle, and it's just so impressive to see how they start with this line and zoom out all the way. Uh, and and the other shot that really sticks out to me is this one shot where she's having sex on the bed with with the two guys in, in her Gemini love triangle, mm -hmm. uh, and there's the edge of the bed, and then it turns into a waterfall. And it just really nicely melts into it. And at first you can't really tell what's happening. But then it's just this incredibly striking image. Like one of the most interesting visual images of the year. Um, and it's it's choices like those that I wish were more prevalent throughout. Mm -hmm. Like there's only a handful of them. Um, but they really make this film stand out in terms of visual creativity. It's like that was an artistic decision. Yeah. And Tucker, I, I I could see what you say what you're saying there, and I'll I'll, I'll make this my closing thought before we get, hand out some scores here. Um, I can see I can understand what you're saying there, and I also agree. I'm like, oh man, I wish I wish I, there was more stuff like that. But ultimately, I think we have to recognize that we're asking. I wish that Andrew Dominic found another way to completely subvert my expectations and yeah. come up with something that's never really been done on in in a film like this, or maybe in film period before. So why didn't he come up with more of those? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think what I would kind of say in closing is that, um, I, ha I do have a, quite a high score for this film that we'll get to in a moment, but it's, I, I think it's film that, uh, that invites you to think about it quite a bit. It is a two hour and 45 minutes. So obviously Andrew Dominic had a lot that he wanted to put in here. I'm sure there's a longer cut of this that Netflix convinced him to cut down to yeah. two hours and 45 minutes. Um, because I think this movie is complex. I think, as I said, Andrew Dominic kind of talks about this film as himself working through and thinking about Marilyn Monroe as an American icon, but also as a human being as well, yeah. and how we really don't treat her as a human being, as a, as the American society. She was I she was a sex symbol for us, and that's really where Marilyn Monroe begins and ends. Um, she, he calls her like the American Aphrodite and she killed herself. What does that say about American celebrity and, yeah. you know, in, uh, our perception of beauty and stuff like that? Andrew Dominic is working through these things and uh, it, it comes through in, in, in the film, I think. And whether that's a good or a bad thing for you and whether you think that's a good or a bad thing for an artist to do to not have their complete vision when they're making a film is an interesting, to interesting topic for certain um, I think this movie brings about a lot of interesting conversations about, you know, art and morals and an artist's vision and stuff like that and what is sure. responsible for art to do. And um, that's that's really why I think that um, conversations will be more constructive about this film. So, sure. again, I invite those uh, in our community in the comments and stuff like that. But, Tucker, do you have closing thoughts or give me your score? Uh, I'm just going to give you my score. The, the movie Blonde for me is fantastic. 
great performances, great visuals, really interesting story, lots of interesting themes about uh, in the industry and film history and, and how we perceive film icons as people, as as icons in, in our in our culture. Uh, it, for me, it's going to get an 8.2 out of 10. Yep, I'm going to give it an 8.6 out of 10. So, there you have it, folks. Uh, absolutely, let us know your thoughts on Blonde and the surrounding controversies in the comments. Thankfully, I don't think we have one uh, as weighted uh, like this coming out in the rest of the year. So, we, we have our due. We've wa we, we have washed our hands of it. There are thoughts on Blonde. Um... Talk to us about it. Talk to us about the movie in the comments, in the Discord. That link's in the description for anyone who wants to join. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you next time.